It's one I thought, okay, I'm I'm good here. You know, I know the, I know some Spanish and I could repeat the phrases that he was given. Mm -hmm. um, and then when I landed in Ecuador, it was a big realization that I had a long, long way to go. And I think this happens with lots of skills, whether it's learning the guitar, trying to learn a sport, learning languages. You have that initial success and then you think, okay, this is great. Welcome back to Beyond Borders, the first talk show made especially for English learners. I had the pleasure to interview Jack from Two Fluency, and you'll have the chance to learn with a real life conversation about our experiences traveling, learning languages, and enjoying life. If you are an intermediate learner, this lesson will help you to improve your English vocabulary. And for the ones looking to step up their English level, there is a range of pronunciation tips for you. But before we jump into the lesson, if you are new here, our channel has helped learners from all over the world to achieve their dream of speaking English, just like Saeed. We want to help you become fluent too and understand fast speaking natives without getting lost, without missing the jokes, and without subtitles. So just hit that subscribe button and the bell on below so that you never miss any of our new lessons again. So we spoke English at home. Mm -hmm. We had a lot of English teacher friends. So we spoke English a lot. Mm -hmm. So I didn't throw myself into that immersive Spanish environment for those two years. I was really dedicated to learn. So I did a lot of studying, but I was doing the wrong thing, like doing the workbooks and doing the grammar. And it wasn't right. really until I moved to the US where my Spanish went from, I'd say again, yeah, A2 to uh, a B2. Um, it's probably regressed a little bit since then, but that's, I started to follow these different techniques that um, a lot of polyglots were sharing online at the time. And it seems like there was a really good community of them by, um, back then. And that's when I start to, to really improve. Yeah, that's really interesting because you fell into the pitfall that I think so many learners fall into the pitfall of when they, they think that studying abroad or living abroad, working abroad, whatever is going to be the magical pill that they're going to you know arrive mm -hmm. there, start speaking English or start speaking whatever language all the time. And overnight, you know, practically they're going to become fluent. But that happens to so many students I've had. And that's really interesting that happened to you and that you actually made more progress in the States than you did uh, while you were abroad, that you were kind of like able to break out of that beginner, lower intermediate level. So we spoke English at home. Mm -hmm. We had a lot of English teacher friends. So we spoke English a lot. Mm -hmm. So I didn't throw myself into that immersive Spanish environment for those two years. To throw yourself into something is to do an activity actively and with enthusiasm. It means that you dedicate time and energy to it. For example, Joan really wanted to work for that company. When she was finally hired, she threw herself into the job. Here, Jack says he didn't throw himself into the immersive Spanish environment while he was living in Spain. If something is immersive, it means that it is deeply engaging and makes you feel that you are part of it. One example of it would be role-playing games, RPG, such as The Witcher, Assassin's Creed, or Final Fantasy. That's why when you immerse yourself in a culture, language, or even in nature, it means that you become completely involved in it. So I said, no, I want to immerse completely into this new culture, new place that I'm in. So I decided to um, name myself Julia and to create this fake identity of a New Yorker living in New York. I was really dedicated to learn, so I did a lot of studying, but I was doing the wrong thing like doing the workbooks and doing the grammar. A person who is dedicated usually works hard and puts all of their effort to achieve what they want. For example, John is such a dedicated student, he's always at the library picking up something new to read. Note that in the example above, I use this word before a noun, student, but you can also use this word with a gerund, verb plus ing. Take a look at these examples. This year, I'm dedicating all my free time to learning English. How many hours of your week will you dedicate to working out? Some foundations are dedicated to preserving the environment. And it wasn't right. really until I moved to the US where my Spanish went from, I'd say again, yeah, A2 to uh, a B2. Um, 
It's probably regressed a little bit since then. Have you noticed how Jack referred to his level of Spanish? He said that it went from A2 to B2. These letters and numbers are the levels represented by the CEFR, the Common European Framework of Reference. As basic, intermediate, and advanced are vague ideas because the meaning of that can vary from place to place. The CEFR is a tool to standardize all across the globe the language proficiency of European languages, such as Spanish, German, Italian, Portuguese, English, and many more. There are six levels according to the CEFR. A1 and A2 represent basic users of the language. B1 and B2 are independent users, and C1 and C2 are proficient users. So the first thing is that you need to make these goals specific. So instead of saying, I want to be fluent, you could say, I want to increase my English by one level this year. So maybe if you're, you're on the European framework, you might say, I want to increase my English from B1 level to B2. And you're actually going to study to be able to, to take that exam and to get to the next level or something like that. But there- um, It's probably regressed a little bit since then. Now, did you notice that Jack said he made huge progress on his Spanish, but he feels that it regressed a bit? If something regresses, it means that it returns to the previous or worse state than it was before. This is very likely to happen when you are learning a new language. If you don't practice it constantly, your language abilities are bound to regress. Or, as we'd say, if you don't use it, you lose it. Now, we don't want this to happen to you. That's exactly why we built the Real Life English app. Now, at the touch of a button, you can speak English in the real world. That's right. You'll connect with other learners, make friends across cultures, develop your speaking confidence, and improve your listening whenever and wherever you want. The best part? It's absolutely free. Just click the link in the description below or search for the Real Life English app in the Google Play or Apple App Store. I started to follow these different techniques that um, a lot of polyglots were sharing online at the time, and it seems like there was a really good community of them. Polyglot is a word used to define a person who speaks or understands many different languages. There are other words that can be used to express your language abilities. For example, for many people, learning English means they become bilingual. It means that they will be able to speak a language that is different from their first language or their mother tongue. Similarly, if you speak three languages, then you're trilingual. So as you said, I, I grew up in a bilingual household. I would still say that English is my first language, but I went, I would, I was surrounded by the Greek language as well as a kid and went to Greek school as well from the age of four. Yeah, that's really interesting because you fell into the pitfall that I think so many learners fall into the pitfall of when they, they think that studying abroad or living abroad, working abroad, whatever is going to be the magical pill that they're going to, you know, arrive mm -hmm. there, start speaking English or start speaking whatever language all the time. And overnight, you know, practically they're going to become fluent. But you fell into the pitfall that I think so many learners fall into. What does pitfall mean? A difficulty or a problem? A delay or interruption? a benefit or advantage. To fall into a pitfall means that you encounter problems or difficulties that you weren't expecting or didn't anticipate. The example of pitfall we mention is thinking that going abroad will immediately improve your language proficiency. To go abroad means traveling, living, studying, or doing business in a foreign country. That is, a country different from the one where you were born or currently live. Example, going abroad is not a magic pill to English fluency. If you say something is a magic pill, it means that it is an easy and fast solution to a problem you have. Other expressions that express the same idea are a silver bullet and a quick fix. And I think you said like there's a lot of people who are very able to be successful staying in their own country. There's a lot of people too who fail going abroad, going to whether they're living abroad. I've had students who lived in the United States and they could, you know, they had all the opportunities in the world to speak the language, but they still, because, you know, they're with family and stuff and they just kind of get comfortable with other people from their home country or that speak their native language and they're not really getting out of their shell. So you might uh, go to another country and that's not really going to be the silver bullet or the magical pill that's all of a sudden you're going to arrive in the United States and all of a sudden your mouth opens and you're speaking perfect American English. That's really interesting that happened to you and that you actually made more progress in the States than you 
did uh, while you were abroad, that you were kind of like able to break out of that beginner, lower intermediate level. Break out literally means to escape from a place or thing, like a prison, for instance. Here, break out of the beginner level means moving away from that level towards becoming more proficient in the language. We use it in this case because it is a difficult thing to accomplish. Now, do you sometimes have the impression that we speak English fast? What happens is not that we speed up our speech when we speak, but rather naturally connect, reduce, or emphasize some words. Take a look at this phrase again. You're kind of like able to break out of that beginner, lower intermediate level. Did you notice that not all the words are pronounced equally with the same speed or emphasis? I don't say it like this. You were kind of like able to break out of that beginner, lower intermediate level. In connected speech, words that deliver the main message or describe something are the ones you'll want to slow down and take your time with. They are usually nouns, adjectives, and adverbs. You're kind of like able to break out of that beginner, lower intermediate level. In contrast, the other words that are used to connect them are the ones you may choose to speed through. They are less important in delivering the message. They are words like prepositions, auxiliary verbs, modal verbs, etc. You're kind of like able to break out of that beginner, lower intermediate level. So this is one of my favorite quotes, something I always try to remember in anything I'm doing, but it's actually by my man Benjamin Franklin, <laughs> tell me and I forget, teach me and I remember, involve me and I learn. Probably makes a, a good destination as well. I mean, you have the, the university there, but it's a place uh, I imagine most people listening have never even heard of in the States, right, Asheville? No, it's, it's coming up on list now. Um, mm -hmm. So people, like the tourists, are just coming in bigger and bigger numbers every year due to it's known for its, its beer, its food, and outdoor lifestyle. So camping and hiking, mountain biking. Um, so that's three things people love. <laughs> Sounds exactly <laughs> like uh, Boulder, where I went to university. I mean, yes. It's like a very, the transplanted community. It's in the mountains. It's all about like outdoor lifestyle. And then, yeah, all the, the food is like beer and like pubs and stuff like this. Mm -hmm. Very big. Yeah, everyone says it's, it's the same. Boulder mm -hmm. and... Um, and Nashville, very similar. And Colorado, I guess, in general. Outdoor, yeah. everyone bikes, beers and breweries, and, and now it's become a, a, a big foodie place. Um, and also high-end cocktail bars now have become a thing. That, I, didn't, I didn't experience that so much in college, I suppose. I, I probably didn't really have the money to go out for high-end cocktails. No, they're expensive now too. <laughs> It's like, you know, yeah, yeah. 15, 16 dollars a cocktail sometimes. Oh my God, <laughs> that's absurd. Probably makes a, a good destination as well. I mean, a destination is a place where people go. For example, South America is a popular holiday destination. Besides that, this word is used to refer to places that are worth making a special trip to visit. Example, that place on Fifth Avenue is definitely a great destination restaurant. And embrace where you're at. You can make it an active learning process to succeed, and we're here with you. Can enjoy the journey, not just the destination. But it's a place uh, I imagine most people listening have never even heard of in the states, right, Asheville? No, it's it's coming up on list now. Jack lives in a small city in North Carolina called Asheville. The city is not a big travel destination for tourists or even locals, but he says that the city is coming up on list now. To come up means that the city is being mentioned or talked about by others as a place worth visiting. For example, sorry I was absent, could you tell me what topics came up in the last meeting? Did you guys talk about going to Mexico? No, that topic didn't even come up. So people, like the tourists are just coming in bigger and bigger numbers every year due to, it's known for its, its beer, its food and outdoor lifestyle. So camping and hiking, mountain biking. Jack says that Asheville is becoming a touristic place due to its outdoor lifestyle. What does due to mean here? Because of, as a result of, as a consequence of. Trick question, they are all correct. Due to expresses the result of something. For example, he became fluent in English due to his consistent efforts. Careful not to confuse it with do, without the preposition to. If you say something is due on a certain day, it means that it is the deadline for it. 
For example, the report is due next Monday. I don't know how different this is in lots of different countries, but our washing machines are kept in the kitchen and this is usually due to lack of space. And I've heard that this is quite unusual in other countries. I'm, I'm intrigued to see how, how that's going to change and if it will change due to just this centralized culture where people are, you know, on YouTube and they're online all the time. It's known for its, its beer, its food and outdoor lifestyle. So camping and hiking, mountain biking. Outdoor is an area that is not under a roof, especially one where there's nature. An outdoor lifestyle means doing activities outdoors, like the ones Jack mentioned, such as camping, running, hiking, etc. Oh, that's so interesting. I mean, in the in the states, we also like use it, but I think of it maybe of like a backpack that you'd use for like outdoor activities. Like CrossFit. Yes. Like a very the transplanted community. It's in the mountains. It's all about like outdoor lifestyle, and then yeah, all the the food is like beer and like pubs and stuff like this. Mm -hmm. Very big. Transplant literally means to transfer something from one place to another. A transplant community, then, is a place inhabited by people who are not originally from that area, but that move there to live. Well, where we live, it's full of what they call transplants. So people have moved here from all over the US. All the, the food is like beer and like pubs and stuff like this. Mm -hmm. Very big. Stuff, in this context, is what we call vague language. Check out how I explained it here. It is very common to hear the word stuff as it can refer to all sorts of things. Stuff is a very useful word and you can use it when you are too lazy to find the right one because it can be used in a general way without mentioning the thing itself by name. That's a good point about like noticing errors and stuff like that for sure. Yeah, everyone says it's it's the same. Boulder and, um, and Nashville, very similar. And Colorado, I guess in general. Outdoor, yeah. everyone bikes, beers and breweries, and, and now it's become a, a, a big foodie place. Jack says that the city has become a foodie place. Foodie is a word used to describe people who are very interested in food and look for places to try out different flavors and dishes. It's the same as gourmet. Another thing that Jack highlights that is turning Asheville into a tourist destination are the breweries. Breweries are the places where beers are produced and sold. It has become a trend for companies to open up their production places for people to hang out and eat something while enjoying a beer that is bought straight from the producer, rather than buying it in a grocery store. To brew is a verb that can also be used when referring to the act of mixing coffee or tea with hot water. I make my coffee and then I can just smell the coffee being brewed right in front of my eyes. It's <laughs> a beautiful thing. <laughs> I'm not sure if that's correct, but that's what I feel. Um, and also high-end cocktail bars now have become a thing. That, I didn't, <laughs> I didn't experience that so much in college. If something is high-end, it means that it's appealing, expensive, appreciated. That's right. High-end is used to refer to things that are either expensive or sophisticated. Due to the nature of it, I mentioned that I didn't experience high-end cocktails in college. Notice how I connect the words didn't and experience. That I didn't, <laughs> I didn't experience that so much in college. In American pronunciation, it is common to remove the T sound when it comes after an N sound and before a vowel sound, like in the words internet and international. When we have an NT contraction of negative auxiliary verbs like don't, won't, haven't, isn't, doesn't, the T doesn't drop. Rather, it's transformed into a glottal T, didn't. If this sound doesn't exist in your language, it can be difficult to hear. That is why learners often confuse can and can't. I explained all about how you can master these two similar sounding words in this video, so be sure to check that out later if you haven't yet. All right, but there's a final caveat here. When you have a word ending in NT, followed by a word beginning with a vowel, the T does in fact drop completely and the two words connect. This is what happened here. Instead of saying, didn't experience, I said, didn't experience. Take a moment to practice it with Justin. So the first example, I wanted to take advantage of the internet to find a dentist. It's now slower. I wanted to. I wanted to take advantage of the internet 
to find a dentist. I wanted to take advantage of the internet to find a dentist. In the second example, there are plenty of international environmental representatives on the internet. There are plenty of international environmental representatives on the internet. Together, there are plenty of international environmental representatives on the internet. I suppose I, I probably didn't really have the money to go out for high-end cocktails. No, they're expensive now too. <laughs> It's like, you know, yeah, 15, yeah. 16 dollars a cocktail USA. sometimes. Oh my God, <laughs> that's absurd. Finally, one of the main skills of a fluent speaker is being able to carry on a conversation. That involves being able to not only attentively listen to what the other person says, but also react to it. Here, you can see I said, oh my God, which is one of the most common reactions we use. That was followed by, that's absurd. Using that plus an adjective is an easy way for you to react and show the other person your opinions on the subject. Check out these examples. Back here, you're still here, <laughs> hanging in. Oh my God, <laughs> wow. And then we moved to Spain for a couple of years before moving to the US. That's fantastic. If you're in the Southern part of the Northern hemisphere, it's not cold. Oh. It's not all cold up here. Well, that's true, <laughs> that's true. I hope you enjoyed learning with the Beyond Borders talk show. Now, before you watch the scene without subtitles and test yourself by answering some quiz questions, run over to our Instagram so that you can be informed of all the lessons we publish every single day. And if you enjoyed this lesson with Jack, well, there is so much more for you to learn. You can download the full interview for free by clicking the link down in the description. Ah, oh, yeah. So we spoke English at home. Mm -hmm. We had a lot of English teacher friends. So we spoke English a lot. Mm. So I didn't throw myself into that immersive Spanish environment for those two years. I was really dedicated to learn. So I did a lot of studying, but I was doing the wrong thing, like doing the workbooks and doing the grammar. And it wasn't right. really until I moved to the US when my Spanish went from, I'd say again, yeah, A2 to uh, a B2. Um, it's probably regressed a little bit since then. But that's, I started to follow these different techniques that um, a lot of polyglots were sharing online at the time. And it seems like there was a really good community of them by, um, back then. And that's when I start to, to really improve. Yeah, that's really interesting because you fell into the pitfall that I think so many learners fall into the pitfall of when they, they think that studying abroad or living abroad, working abroad, whatever is going to be the magical pill. That they're going to you know arrive mm -hmm. there start speaking English or start speaking whatever language all the time and overnight, you know, practically they're going to become fluent. But that happens to so many students I've had. And that's really interesting that happened to you and that you actually made more progress in the States than you did uh, while you were abroad, that you were kind of like able to break out of that beginner, lower intermediate level. Probably makes it a good destination as well. I mean, you have the, the university there, but it's a place uh, I imagine most people listening have never even heard of in the States, right, Asheville? No, it's it's coming up on list now. Um, mm -hmm. So people, like the tourists, are just coming in bigger and bigger numbers every year. Due to, it's known for its its beer, its food, and outdoor lifestyle. So camping and hiking, mountain biking. Um, so that's three things people love. <laughs> Sounds exactly <laughs> like uh, Boulder, where I went to university. I mean, yes. It's like a very, the transplanted community. It's in the mountains. It's all about like outdoor lifestyle. And then... Yeah, all the, the food is like beer and like pubs and stuff like this, mm -hmm. very big. Yeah, everyone says it's it's the same. Boulder mm -hmm. and, um, and Nashville, very similar. And Colorado, I guess, in general. Outdoor, yeah. everyone bikes, beers and breweries, and, and now it's become a, a, a big foodie place. Um, 
and also high-end cocktail bars now have become a thing that i didn't i didn't experience that so much in college i suppose i i probably didn't really have the money to go out for high-end cocktails no they're expensive now too <laughs> It's like, you know, yeah, 15, yeah. 16 dollars a cocktail sometimes. Oh my God, <laughs> that's absurd. Psychological pattern, uh, but it usually hits hard marginalized communities, people of color, women, LGBTQ, and, mm -hmm. you know, from my perspective, also non-native speakers of English. And then as a teacher, you also have to become an authority and teach and tell other people what to do in a language that sometimes you feel insecure.